Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world Hold of movies, together. plus some insight into what it all means. This is a very G-rated show. <laughs> Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Congratulations to everybody who cheers for Bama. Also here, John Schnapp. Hey, what's going on? Penis. I knew it. 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 Also here, Christian Harlov. I was like, is he? I was like, yes, of course he's going to do that. And why? Because Ashley Mova hates the Peanuts movie. Oh, gosh. It's a long story. Emphasis on the long. She doesn't hate it. I'm kidding. She hasn't seen it. It's going to be one of those days. Hey, listen, guys, as happens sometimes, before we can get to the plethora of glorious movie news stories over here, which we wrote out. A few things, actually three big things have dropped. Uh, she's already grinning. Have dropped since we wrote the show notes <laughs> earlier this morning. And we're going to start with this one. The first one is a brand new trailer for the film Hail Caesar dropped this morning. Uh, of course, Hail Caesar's new film by the Coen brothers dropped their first trailer a couple of weeks ago. We really enjoyed what we saw. I mean, it's the Coen brothers. But anyway, Christian, you had a chance to see it. What do you think of this new trailer? I loved it, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to this movie. It was on my. It's in my top Five anticipated of the year. This looks like classic Coen Brothers stuff with with the humor, and we'll get some crazy drama in it as well too. But I just I, and I love that the little the back and forth, that pacing, mm. the pacing of the Coen Brothers is how you know. Like we, we talked about it last week, Chef, with you and I, when there are certain directors out there, whether it be a Tarantino or a Nolan, that you can identify their style. The Coen Brothers are a perfect example of that as well. You, you didn't even have to tell me that it was Hell Caesar, but if I would have just seen that scene, knew nothing about it, I was a, that's a Coen Brothers movie. Totally. I'm, I'm on board. Here's the thing. If you had told me that, okay, the next show you're going to see and you described it to me, like it's going to be a director talking to an actor and it's just them over and over again trying to get a line right, I, say, I would say that sounds pretty stupid. But I laughed my ass off the first time I watched it. I was watching it in my office earlier this morning, and I just laughed. And why? You know, and, and I'm guilty of this. Ray Fiennes is simply one of the finest actors alive today. And a, a lot of times we will always mention the Daniel day Lewis's, the Russell Crowe's, the Tom Hanks, Leo DiCaprio's, and things like that, obviously. But Ray Fiennes, believe, but Ray Fiennes belongs in that top five maybe actors alive right now mm -hmm. list. He's just so good. And when you're watching this trailer and he's sitting there painfully trying to get this young actor, like, would the detour so simple? I'm trying to get him to say that. I feel, I feel like that every day on this freaking set. But uh, watching him do it with that dude was priceless. And you're right. It felt so Coen's brother. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. I, you know, it was in my top 10 most anticipated films of the year. I think it's vaulted into my top five yeah. most anticipated 2016. Now, anyway, Schnapp, you saw. What do you think? Yeah, I love the Coen Brothers films, Big Lebowski. This definitely had that Barton Fink flavor to it. Where <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I yeah. love the way they like dig into the, the, his, the behind the scenes on Hollywood productions and just the business in general. So this had all those elements of all their past films. It even had a little flavor of the Hudsucker proxy for me. I cannot wait. This trailer alone... I mean, you could have you sold me last year when they just announced that they're writing and directing another movie. Um, but yeah, the back and forth and using the their miscommunication while they're adding and showing other scenes from the film. It's a brilliant trailer. So I cannot wait to see this. I love it. All right. Well, another trailer also dropped actually two for the same film. We're going to be focusing on the Red Band one. Two new trailers for the new film. Triple Nine also dropped this morning. There was a Green Band one uh, and then there was the Red Band one. The Red Band one just kicked me in the face. And just and Schnepp put it back. We were standing there watching it together, and he says, "I feel like I feel dirty watching." What did you? I can't. Remember. I said, "I feel grimy. I need to take a shower after watching this trailer because it's just so unrepentantly gro grotesque and morbid and sickeningly violent." I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think about it? Man, I love that. This is. I was talking about the anticipated list. I regret not putting this in my top ten because. I love John Hillcoat as a director. Yeah. Mm. Proposition, I think, is one of the most underrated films out there. And then this this had elements of, of True Detective meets Traffic meets Heat uh, meets Sicario. There are so many cool memories that I had about other crazy movies like this. And what a cast. I mean, the cast mm. is crazy. And what I also love what they did is they took some, some of the cast from really popular television shows that had phenomenal acting. You had like Breaking Bad. You have Aaron Paul. You got Walking Dead. There's Norman Reedus mm -hmm. in it. Um, and I think that this is a this is a movie that I think is going to be on a lot of people's lists once the word starts to come out there. Now it's not going to be for everybody, like you said. It, they're they're going to go balls to the wall. And Hillcoat did that in the proposition. Mm -hmm. And I believe. And didn't he do he did the road also? Didn't he? 
yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he, he did, did the road as well too. So he likes to play in the grimy world, mm -hmm. um, and I think that this is another one. This is going to be a phenomenal movie. It felt intense. It felt violent. It felt visceral. Uh, it reminds me. What was that one? Uh, Colors. It reminded me a lot of that. Uh, Definitely that film. Colors. A lot it had that kind of, but a little bit more up to on the next rung of the ladder. Yeah. A bit. I cannot wait to see this film. Oh, uh, real quick. You know who also really stood out to me in that? Even though you had this big, huge cast, Clifton Collins Jr. Oh yeah. Thing about the, just the, the cops that he was talking about, and like he, and he was also in Traffic. He's another guy that really adds. It's like those when we talk about character actors last week, and, we, and he's another guy that always adds to a, especially a cast like this. I, I think this will yeah. be. His best performance yeah. since uh, uh, what's uh, Pacific Rim? Yes, <laughs> best performance. Uh, well, I, I specifically <laughs> like this tra this newer trailer because I thought the the trailer that happened before I thought I felt a little like it told a little too much of the story in order, and this trailer felt like more of a mixture of just really intense scenes. Yeah. So you get an idea that they're doing this heist and it goes wrong, but then everything else is kind yeah. of mixed in. It looks just really intense. Yeah, so both those trailers, both the Hail Caesar trailer and the new Green Band, and probably by now the Red Band one, you should be able to find on YouTube. So go on over and check that out. Now, probably a little bit more important on the news today, if you're a director, Probably the one trophy you want on your mantle more than anything else is an Oscar. But the next most important one, if you're a director, is probably the DGA, the Directors Guild of America, which is, you know, voted on by directors. So it's kind of now, for the 2016 DGA Awards, they did just announce their list of nominees this year. And here are the five nominees. Alejandro Duratu for The Revenant, no surprise. Tom McCarthy for Spotlight, again, no surprise. Adam McKay for The Big Short. Little surprise there, but it's but I'm happy to see his name on there. George Miller for Mad Max Fury Road. Ridley and Ridley Scott for The Martian. Schnepp, you had a chance to take a look at this list. What do you think of it? Yeah, I actually voted for it because I'm in the DGA. Oh, that's right. And I voted for two of those five, which I will not tell you. But I will say <laughs> Ridley Scott's The Martian is one of the greatest comedies to come out in 2015. So says the Golden Globes. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'll say about that. Um, I love that Adam McKay got nominated. I love that he was nominated for this film because even hearing his story about how he read this novel, um, turned to his wife and said, I want to direct this, but no one's really going to let me do it. I'm the funny or die guy. you know. And he <laughs> did. And man, did he do a phenomenal job for a guy who's so, it's so out of his wheelhouse from mm -hmm. the stuff that we had seen. Well, it's actually, it's not out of his wheelhouse after you see what he's able to do, but we just assumed it would be. So I'm glad to see him there. Um, I don't know, you know, I think because it's the DGA, I think George Miller is going to win this one. I don't think he's going to mm. win any of the other ones. I think that the DGA is going to give it to George Miller. I would agree with you. I mean, I think that I that was yeah, I'll just tell you that was my top. <laughs> yeah. That was my top number one. He was in the number one slot, and why? Because it is an incredibly, incredibly directed. You have film. such a weak will. No, I'm I not going to tell you, but, but maybe I know, George right. Miller. Right, you pushed me over. Like, <laughs> tell me your ATM pin yeah. number. Uh, Forty-seven, thirty-eight, forty-two. One, it's only supposed two, to be four numbers. Three. Yeah. Um, for me, I, look, before I saw Spotlight, and I had those of you guys who've watched the show for any period of time, you know, over the last couple of years, I've kind of lost faith in Ridley Scott. I mean, and you can't blame me. He has put out sure. in the last number of years stinker after stinker after stinker. And I was intrigued by The Martian. When you understand what went into directing that film and how much he has to have pop off the screen, despite the fact that it's one man and an environment. And what he did in that movie just absolutely floored me. And until I saw one particular movie, Ridley Scott probably would have been my pick for Best Director of the Year. But then I saw Spotlight. And the thing about, and I'm not saying Spotlight is my absolute favorite film of the year, but the thing about Spotlight is, and we talked about this when we reviewed it, is that that is a movie with so much information and so many moving parts that an audience member could very easily get lost in the trappings of it, right? But somehow McCarthy found a way to navigate that ship that as an audience member, I felt like I was never a step behind. I felt like he kept me bringing along, but he didn't compromise the pace of the film either at the same time. It is absolutely one of the best directorial efforts I've seen in years when you really consider how that story was told. So I love, I would not argue though with any of the names on this list. No. If any of these guys won, 
no complaints for me. I think it all sounds great. Yeah, it'd be very, very close, too. It's funny you brought up Spotlight, because another film that came out in 2015 that was close was Truth. It was about... Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. first you, time director. Yeah, yeah, but you look at how they're directed and how like Spotlight just draws you in and how it really makes it a team film. And to me, I, I felt like Truth was just like, here's another shot with somebody zooming in on a character while they're reading something. I agree with you. I just think, though, for what that guy did as a first time director mm -hmm. was pretty impressive. I mean, not that Truth should have been nominated, but I think I, that was a first thing that guy ever did uh, so I was the movie itself was, it was okay but Spotlight Spotlight's incredible the rhythm yeah. of Spotlight yeah. oh yeah it just draws you yeah. in and just I like, agree <sighs> all right folks let's get to the first official story of the day all right for a few weeks now it has been reported that Creed and Fruitvale Station director Ryan Coogler has been in talks with Marvel Studios about directing their upcoming film Black Panther as some of you may recall Selma director Ava DuVernay was offered the Black Panther film but she ultimately decided to turn it down however Coogler didn't seem to want to pass up the chance as Marvel has confirmed he is now signed on to helm the project Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige said the following we are fortunate to have such an esteemed filmmaker join the Marvel family. The talents Ryan showcased in his first two films easily made him our top choice to direct Black Panther. Many fans have waited a long time to see Black Panther in his own film, and with Ryan, we know we found the perfect director to bring T'Challa's story to life. John, what do you think of Ryan Coogler helming Black Panther? Uh, yeah, our, our first choice, you know, other than Ava DuVernay <laughs> and other than whoever else we offered it to before you. But then you're our first choice. No, I love this. I mean, look, I like the idea of him directing Black Panther just after seeing Fruitvale Station and then seeing, OK, you know, what's that beginner's luck? But then he did Creed. And look, don't underestimate what a tall order bringing Creed to the big screen was. You know, you tell the story quite often, but Sylvester Stallone didn't even want this movie to be done. Until he went and saw Fruitvale Station. It was like, okay, kid, come on back. Let's talk about Creed. You know, you had a lot of ex expectations. You had a lot of people giggling and snorting when the idea of, oh, now Creed, another Sylvester Stallone, another Rocky Balboa universe film. And he made a human story, a fun story, an exciting story, uh, an emotional story. All that wrapped into one. And that had a lot of us coming out of theaters not laughing anymore. Now we were like, when the hell are they going to do another one? We'll get to that in just a second. This guy is a now proven... Hollywood talent. He can tell a story. He can make it fun and exciting all at the same time. That's what you need in a Marvel film. This is fantastic news to me, so I'm really excited about it. Christian? I love this news. I love this dude, man. He is awesome. He is one of the, he's a guy you are so happy that he is in the Hollywood system now because he's a young kid. He's like 26, 27 years old. He did something in the smaller um, realm with, with Fruitvale Station and knocked it out of the park. And then he, with Creed, even though, yeah, it was it was still had that kind of drama drama and the originality of, of the, the first movie of Rocky. It still is a commercial movie. So it showed, yeah, I can go from the small film into commercial and I can make it work. And he did make it work. And because of it, Stallone has a, a, a Golden Globe. And next time you should thank him when you win. Um, <laughs> but the, the thing was, like, he, he's just, he has passion. He's a fan. And he's a humble dude. He's a good dude. And he wants to make, he wants to make movies for fans. He wants well, you've to, met with him before. Uh, twice. Yeah. I, I met with him. I interviewed him uh, for the Creed uh, when, when I got to talk to him about Creed, but then I ran into him at a, at a Star Wars premiere, and I talked right. to him for like 15 minutes, and he's just, and I asked him about Black Panther at times. Like, he's like, oh, that's 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 not happening yet, but because he, 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 he couldn't mm -hmm. say anything, but this you with him and now with uh with, Ch with Chad, Chadwick working with him and Andy Serkis probably being the yeah. main villain. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't, I can't wait. This is going to be exciting. It bums me out. We'll get to the next story in a second. Um, but I still I hope he has a lot of involvement with Creed as it moves forward. But this is a great thing. And he's becoming one of my favorite directors fast. Shep. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, th I think the his directing on Creed was the next notch up from Fruitvale Station. But Fruitvale Station was really well directed. And the reason they get directors like this is not for the action because they can get all those fight scenes and choreography. But what they want is to people who can connect the emotionality of the of the characters and that's the most important thing in all the marvel films you care about steve rogers they're going to be introduced to t'challa in this brand new civil war film and then he's going to get his own film so you have to actually be invested and so when you're invested in the characters that's the most important thing and that's what both of uh uh, Kugler's films have shown me that he's a good director and he can do that. So you I'm raise a great point too about the action because a lot of times the director himself is not the one choreographing the action. Right. You know they have second unit directors or other people who specialize in that. 
but you still need a great director who knows how to take that action and then fit it into the story so it flows and it has that connective tissue between the dramatic elements the characters and the action otherwise you just get what I call visual noise mm -hmm. right so and, and he's a director who's shown he knows how to do that so I can't wait to see what they do with Black Panther me too because like right off your point Jeff, because what I want to see because Black Panther is not a super well known property for fans right. who are not familiar with the comic books so I want to see what he's able to do and how much they, they allow him. I, I don't think they're going to handcuff him. I really right. don't. I, I don't think they should because I think, obviously, he's got to follow the story of the MCU and follow the script. But I want to see the development of what he's able to do, just like we were talking about, because this is the first time we're really going to be introduced to him. Civil War, you'll see him fighting and stuff too, but who he is, what his backstory is, and then the same thing with Andy Serkis as well mm -hmm. too, because Andy Serkis recently with Snoke, and I mean, you got some more with, with Caesar, but I want to see him more acting, and I want to see more about the development of his character as well, so this is great. All right, what's next? Well, speaking of Ryan Coogler, his most recent film, Creed, is still in theaters and has a, had a lot of people wondering when we can expect a sequel to the film. Apparently, not long. According to a report in Variety, MGM CEO Gary Barber has stated that the company is looking at having a new Creed film in theaters by November 2017. Now, obviously, this aggressive schedule rules out director Ryan Coogler from returning for the sequel, as his new Black Panther film has already a a February 2018 release date. Christian, what do you think of MGM's plan for a 2017 Creed 2 and their need to do it without Coogler directing the project? I understand why they're doing it and why they're doing it um, fast because I think they've always had, I think Ryan Coogler, Stallone, they've all had ideas as far as number two goes. They, it was never a one-off for right, them. Yeah. They always had ideas to, to, if it did well, how to further it. So I think that the structure is already there. I don't like that he's not directing it, but I get it. I think that as long as he is writing and producing, and it's Stallone's franchise. I mean, Stallone knows don't, and, and please, not yet. If you're going to follow the beats, don't kill Stallone off in Creed 2. <laughs> he, still, he still needs him to win the title. Um, but I think it's great. I think it's smart. I think it's you capitalize off of it because, again, Stallone is close to 70 years old mm -hmm. or whatever he is, too. You, you, you've got to take advantage of it now. And people forget fast. Right now, Stallone, he's he's might win the Oscar. He's just won the Golden Globe. And two years is not... I mean, that's that's fast to get it out there, oh, too. Oh, yeah, it is. So it, makes me, it actually makes me confident, though. It doesn't make me think that they're just rushing a sequel because I do think that they have the idea for it. But they got to lock in a director that is a fan of the franchise. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know that you don't always need a fan of the property, but I think you need a Rocky fan and you need someone that is going to work well with Coogler and you're going to need somebody, obviously, who works well with Stallone and Jordan. Well, this is not a surprise because it was either last week or two weeks ago we heard Stallone come out and make a very you know accurate observation. He said, look, there's a diminishing return thing these days for how long you should wait between sequels. We've got momentum right now. We surprised a lot of people with Creed. The last thing we need to do is make them wait three or four more years to return to that franchise, strike while the iron's hot. And you know, Stallone isn't getting any younger, as are none of us, right? So he's still at a prime... I, for Stallone, he's still kind of in a prime age that he can still pull it all out and do anything. He can even get a little bit into some physicality at this point because yeah. he's in such great shape. I love the scenes in Creed where he's training with them and he's on the speed bag with them. And that, that was almost a detriment to other parts of the movie where I go, come on, Sly, don't start trying to convince me you're some frail old man now. Right. Like we know under, he, despite the fact that you're wearing five sweatshirts over this incredibly muscular body of yours, we know the way you can do, but still that worked great. So we, Stallone kind of hinted at this and it makes sense. I would have liked to have seen Coogler come back, but this is a good move for him as well. And from what we understand, Coogler will still probably be involved in the writing and the producing of the film. To some degree, he's going to be very busy with Black Panther, obviously. But I think he's still going to have a hand in helping steer the ship as well. So I think it's in good hands. Yeah, I wonder if, uh, if Coogler is going to be involved in picking his replacement. Because that could be a good so. thing. That's possible. I mean, yeah, I hope yeah. so. that, uh, him and Stallone could, like, you know, there's so many other directors out there who not only would have a passion for the Rocky films, but just a passion for sports in general. Yeah. So I don't think it'll be that hard to get a great director to do Creed 2. It just depends on, like, getting them, you know, getting the right fit. So I'm sure they'll do it. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So Ashley, what do we got? 
As most of you know, James Gunn is already working on the upcoming Marvel film Guardians of the Galaxy 2, set for release in May of 2017. However, one character that won't be returning this time is actor Benicio Del Toro's The Collector. In a recent interview with Coming Soon, the Oscar winner said the following when asked if The Collector would appear in Guardians 2. I don't think so. They would have told me, I hope. I do hope to play that character again at some point. Schnett, buy or sell Marvel leaving the collector out of Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Uh, I don't buy it, so I sell it. I think it would take one day. Like, he's going to be in Star Wars. Who knows he's playing? He's going to blue blue face guy. Then he goes back and puts <laughs> this weird wig on. It would take him one day to shoot a scene as the collector. They don't have to tell him. They could tell him in three months. He's working on Star Wars. He's like, there's probably their lots are right next to each other. So they'd be like, hey, Del Toro, you want to be the collector? Sure. <laughs> they do it. I don't buy it at all. I'm sure he's going to be in the movie. Uh, I completely buy it. I, I believe that they don't need him there either. I mean, the collector is one of those characters where he serves a function, and he served a function mm -hmm. in the first Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, he's clearly going to serve a function at some point in the MCU, because as far as we know, he's still got one of them Infinity Gems. Mm -hmm. He's still in possession of one of them, so at some point he's got to come back into play, but it doesn't have to be in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. And it, honestly... If done the wrong way, you could feel like they forced him in there just to have him there. And what's the point? So I know they're going to come back to him at some point. I totally buy the idea that he's not going to be there in this one. Yeah, I buy it as well, too, because I also think they probably lock him down for a certain amount of movies when they sign him on, too. And they, maybe they just don't need him for this one. So why, yeah. why waste the performance if they don't need him if it's not helping in the story and they don't want to repeat the same beats from the first one, maybe? If they go, oh, what do we need to do? We need to talk to the collector again. It's like, yeah, you did that in the first movie. But then if he appears in something like the next Avengers movie or, or anything, even pops up in a Thor film, like that could be, I think. Well, his first use, appearance was in a Thor film. Right, he was in the post credits. In the post credits, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, like you know, in maybe a little bit more of a role if they if they need him. But I think that and maybe capitalize more on on Star Wars after it comes out. You know, it's more recognizable face, even though it's Benicio del Toro, but still yeah, to the Star Wars the Star Wars audience. Um, so overall, I think that we don't really, maybe they don't need him. Maybe James Gunn just doesn't need him this time around. So I buy it. He's definitely not necessary, but it wouldn't it be easy to just like cut to Thanos and the collector's already there? But right, but that, you know what I mean? Be though forcing it just for the sake of doing it? I don't know. I mean, but, it's but I'm gonna, saying it has you sign, to happen. But if you sign Benicio del Toro to like five movies, do you want to just throw him in for like one scene to shoot it, or do you want to maybe utilize him a little bit more and and take that appearance? I think Ragnarok is actually. I hadn't considered that before. Ragnarok. I mean. so, we may see him pop back up mm, in Ragnarok. Yeah, that's true. All right, what's next? As many of you may remember, Lionsgate is currently in development of a new take on the Robin Hood story in their project, Robin Hood Origins, <laughs> which will star Kingsman the Secret Service actor Taron Egerton as the title character. Now, according to a report in Deadline, Academy Award winner Jamie Foxx has signed on to play the role of Little John. John Byers saw Jamie Foxx playing Little John in Robin Hood Origins. First of all, thank you, Ray, because that is my favorite <laughs> Little John character ever portrayed. I love that Little Little John character, and I love that movie, by the way. Um, I don't know how to feel about this. I mean, it, it is certainly, it's a different take because now you're taking the Little John character and from the full description in the stories that I read that basically he was also on the other side of the wars in the crusade. So in a way, he's kind of a Morgan Freeman character. Because you remember in the... Uh, and the, in Prince of Thieves, you know, Morgan, Morgan Freeman comes back with Robin Hood uh, as a friend. And it seems like in this point, he's coming back from the Crusades as well. Only he's Little John now. So it's a different take. I don't know how to feel about it at this point since I don't really know the grander context. But I like Jamie Foxx. He's an Academy Award winner. I think he can be funny when he needs to be funny. I think he can be dramatic when he needs to be dramatic. So at this point, I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. and I'm going to give it a bye. Ooh, the lolly. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it as well. I think that I, I, I actually really could see them playing off each other too, Taron Egerton and, yeah. and, and Jamie Foxx. So I think this could be an interesting take. I don't know who's directing it. Do we know who's directing it? We do. We I'll do. look that up. I Let me see because I could, I could sell it. Mel fast. Brooks. <laughs> if this is like Robin Hood Men in Tights 2. Buy it. I, I, it depends on director. And I, and I asked, as Ashley was reading, um, I was, I, if, if Disney was doing it. And I guess Disney's not doing it. So not that that means anything. Because Rob, it's just that I'm just worried about the origin story because Ridley Scott just tried to do it and that sure. didn't work out. Oh, that was too terrible. Great. Um, How many, isn't there like four other competing Robin Hoods? That's what Hollywood Yeah, like does there's, there's at least one other yeah, there's competing at least one, Robin Hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. just Depends so. on who's directing it, I think, too. Uh, it's being directed by uh, a director I'd never heard of before, Otto Bathurst, who has directed such classics as <laughs> Urban and Urban Goth, 
or urban gothic and nylon. God bless you. Yes. So anyway, <laughs> snap. Jamie Foxx playing Little John. Jamie Foxx. Well, anything will be better than Electro, so I guess <laughs> when you start from the bottom. I want him to play it the exact same way. Be like, where's Robin Hood? I'm like, oh, I'm not. I don't know. Oh. Um, Still from the ranch, gift to the ball. That's right. <laughs> Whispering. Oh. oh, you just almost made me throw up in my mouth a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll buy it just for the simple fact that, you know, from the bottom comes the top. So. Right. From the bottom comes the top. I don't even know what that means. All right, what's next? I understand it. With Star Wars The Force Awakens starting to wind down its theatrical it's one, like attention is starting to turn to the upcoming Star Wars films, including Rogue One and, of course, Star Wars Episode Eight. In a recent interview with Vogue, actor John Boyega made the following comments about Episode Eight and his role. We're just starting to work on Star Wars 8, the next film, so I'm back to keeping secrets again. It's great, much darker, but we're very excited. My part in the next film will be much more physical, so I might be in the gym a bit more. Christian Byersell, a darker Star Wars Episode 8. Buy, and I don't think anyone's surprised. You don't bring Ryan Johnson in for Sunshine and Rainbows. You know, like, <laughs> like right. he, this, we knew this. We knew this when he was brought in. Plus, if you look at... Um, whether or not you think it's a good or a bad thing with, with episode seven being an homage to episode four, I would not be surprised episode eight is an homage to episode five. And not maybe beat by beat, but as far as tone. Right. And I think that that's why, again, you bring in Ryan Johnson not only to direct, but he's writing it as well. So this is absolutely no surprise. It is something that should happen because the second, the second film in a trilogy, I think, should be the darker and should be the more stakes and more things happen to the characters. So, yeah, I'm, I'm buying it. You don't think of happiness and rainbows when you think of Looper? Mm -hmm. nah, not really. No, no this is, you know, we've, we've been speculating for a very long time. Even when they just announced there's going to be a new trilogy, we always thought the second one is going to be the bad things are going to happen, the dark comedy, if you will, of this. And a lot of middle chapters in these trilogies often are. Like, this is the really the dark times. So that's not a surprise. I didn't know, actually, after the first one, how big of a role that Boyega would have going forward, but sounding him saying that there's going to be a lot more action, so he's got to be in the gym a bit more, that kind of excites me. So having Ryan Johnson on there directing it, having it take a darker turn, more action, all that kind of stuff, that all sounds pretty good to me, so it's a buy for me. Yeah, it's a buy for me, too. I think Boyega is an amazing actor. His comic chops were really fun. He was such a comic relief when you didn't expect him. He was my favorite part of the him. movie. Yeah, he made multiple viewings all the more... <laughs> fun for me so from from attack the block to this to see him growing as an actor is great so i'm glad he's getting an expanded role and i look forward to to johnson's take on the star wars universe and bringing like an empire strikes back feel to it so i'm all for it is he writing episode nine he is he's he writing is. eight and nine that's great yeah. okay good I'm, I'm excited about that all right what's next with an October 7th release date still in the books, many people have been wondering when the announced Gambit movie starring Channing Tatum would finally start to go into production. While according to a local ABC station, the new X-Men Universe film is supposedly slated to go into production in March. Gambit is being directed by Edge of Tomorrow and Mr. and Mrs. Smith Helmer Doug Lyman. Schnepp, if Gambit does indeed go into production, buyers sell that it can still make the current October 7th release. Yeah, I buy it. I mean, they've got $150 million. I mean, <laughs> that should at least <laughs> buy half out. of a country or something like, all of you must finish the graphics, you know? <laughs> it's like, how long is the shoot? March, April, May. Just say, say it's a 90-day a uh, shoot. That's which pretty is, Which is not unreasonable. Right, it's not unreasonable, but that's not extravagant, but it's also more than like normal films, or like 21 days, 31 days, 90 days. Sure, that's March, April, May, and they could bust all those effects out. They could totally get that October deadline. I'd like to see them meet that October deadline too, that release date. Yeah, I'm excited to hear that they're finally shooting it. That's great. I am going to sell it, but but only by the skin of because I agree with you. I believe it's possible. I do believe it is possible, but if I had to say buy or sell, I still got to believe that in the next month they're going to announce pushing the film back. Mm. Uh, I just think they're going to take more time because while it's possible, they're not leaving themselves a lot of wiggle room. They're not leaving themselves a lot of room for error in this. They don't have a lot of room here that if they decided that this wasn't working to schedule three more weeks to go back and reshoot something, which you normally like to give yourself a little bit of that padding. So while I totally agree with you that it is possible, if I had to put money on it, I'd say we're going to hear it gets pushed into 2017 at some point. What do you think? Yeah, see, we talked about it the other day, and we and I, I was we both thought if it was, something wasn't announced pretty soon, we're looking at 2017. Right. Something is kind of announced. I'm just going to buy it because of scheduling. I'm mm. going to buy it because of, of 
Channing Tatum's schedule, they're probably like, wait a minute, we got to, and maybe Lyman's schedule too, I don't know, but as far as Tatum's schedule, we have to get this done now. And if we want to make this in October, and so we don't have to push it back even more so because this guy's all tied up, because the guy works all the time. Mm -hmm. He was like three or four movies a year. Um, so I think it's going to happen. I, I still think it's a bit of a mistake to push it out this fast because I think that if the amount of time, like you said, 90 day shoot, then, then just really going into overload and, and really <laughs> stressing out your editors and, and everyone else too. Um, but I think it could happen and I don't know how great it'll be if it comes out in October, but I do think it's going to happen. Yeah, for, I mean, for all we know, they've put a year into pre-production. They've right. got this right. all, this brilliant yeah. film all mapped out. H who's to say, well, let's, we'll certainly know for sure in the next two months. Deadpool. Remember that? That was shot yeah. just a couple, uh, like eight months ago. Yeah, the difference, though, with Deadpool is they had the same director on the whole entire time, mm -hmm. and they had this. In, yeah, Lyman just had, came out kind of last like, minute. There was there's so there, like everybody was dropping out of it. They didn't know what they were going to do. Tatum at one point was gone, and then he's back. Like, there was one hundred fifty million dollars. Right, right. It was a, it was a, like Deadpool was like, we got this. Let us go. Let us do right. our thing. Boom. Uh, th this has been a bit of a mess up until now. Well, no, guys, come on. At the last minute, Brett Ratner came on to direct X Men Three, and that <laughs> right. turned out all right, right? Meg Nino's hideout right. was in the woods. Right. Why? Oh. Many right, metal. Folks. Well, yeah. it is Tuesday, which means it's time for us to talk about what is opening this week. Brought to you by our good friends over at AMC Theaters on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We talk about the films opening wide. Today, we got one we're going to discuss. So, Ashley, what's on the block? First up this week is the new Michael Bay film, 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. On the evening of the 11th anniversary of the September 11th attacks, a group of Islamic militants attacked the American diplomatic compound and a nearby CIA annex in Benghazi, Libya. CIA security contractors, military veterans who served with the Navy SEALs, Marine Force Recon, and Army Special Forces undertake a desperate defense of the American ambassador and his staff within the diplomatic compound. Christian, should people be looking forward to 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi? I'm going to say yes, even though it's Michael Bay. And Dennis and I were talking about this last night. Um, the guy doesn't know how to be subtle. So, uh, and not that this movie necessarily has to what? be... What? <laughs> not that this movie necessarily Bam! has to be a subtle movie. <laughs> but slow motion, the, the you know, the, the, the overdramatic music when it's not necessary. Like, I want him to tell a story because... When he always puts together great trailers. Always. The Pearl Harbor trailer is still one of the best trailers of all time, <laughs> and that movie is a mess. And it threw in some ridiculous love story that didn't need to be in there, and it was so... It could have focused on one of the... the, the one of the, you know, the uh, historical moment, especially... If, well, you're Canadian, but as far as we go, um, and, and it was just ruined. And I don't want him to do that with this. I don't think he will. I don't think he will. I think this is going to fit more towards The Rock and something. I hope so. I hope that we get a little bit, and even more serious than even that film. So I, I think that we should give it a chance and see what happens. I am actually looking forward to the movie. Now, once again, uh, Michael Bay, Kool-Aid me. Yeah. <laughs> When it comes to Michael Bay and his trailers, I mean, he gets me hook, line, and sinker with all the Transformers trailers, and I buy into it. Then I go see it, and I want to punch myself in the face after I do. But if you are going to describe, if you're going to sit down, let's go back one year, and you're going to say, describe the perfect situation. Describe the perfect movie for Michael Bay to direct and for Michael Bay to really shine you would probably end up describing 13 hours. This is the right film for him. The trailers do look good. I know I say that every time with a Michael Bay film, but it does really feel like this is the right kind of project. This feels like the type of project that sets Michael Bay up to succeed. And because of that, I'm going in with some pretty high hopes. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it, it sometimes it, it runs the gamut, you know. It's like I, I enjoyed Pain and Gain. There's a few Me films too. that Michael Bay has made that I actually liked. I think he's a good filmmaker. Once again, this kind of this kind of film, though, you have to care about what's going on. So that's what is really the trailer is great as far as an action film, you know, trailer with explosions, whatnot. This is something about something that really happened. Can we really care about what's the situation is? Are we going to be Can invested? Can he make us care about it? That's what I mean. Are we going to be invested in it by the time it gets to all the slow motion and tanks exploding and the, like the ghost shots that we've seen right. from the trailer? That's really what is hinging on this film is the first hour because we know what the last half hour is going to be, but are we going to care about it? So I'm interested to see what happens. I will say this though, and I it, it, it sounds like I'm joking, but I'm not. If at some point in that first hour, there's some hot girl bending over a military Jeep washing the hood in nothing like bikini bonds, I'm checking out. I don't think we're going to get that in this movie. I really hope I not, really but I, I will yeah. totally check out at that point. 
All right, folks. Well, listen, it's that time of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, as we often do, we are doing the show live. So if you are watching us live, we're going to save a few minutes at the end of the show to take some of your questions live. How do you get a live question on? Simple. Make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video and just start tweeting in some questions. Ashley will be our gatekeeper today and she'll pick out a few. But for now, let's get to the mailbag question of the day. So, Ashley, what's in there? Peter Ramirez writes, I have been a fan of the show since the For Your Consideration days. I enjoy all your content and appreciate all the hard work you guys put in Thank you, to Peter. make my work days a little less boring. <laughs> since we are in the NFL playoff season, I have a question that involves both. The NFL has what they call the Rooney Rule, where every team must at least interview one minority candidate before hiring a head coach or senior executive. Do you think this could work in Hollywood? So many people complain about the lack of women and minority directors in Hollywood. Do you think this could help at least give them a fair shot at a major motion picture? Do you think this would work logistically in Hollywood? Okay, so the Rooney Rule, I think, is one of the one of the better things that the NFL has done. And here's the key about the Rooney Rule, because some people misunderstand the Rooney Rule. The Rooney Rule does not say, tell a, a team or an owner who you must hire. It simply says, you must expose yourself to different options in the interviewing process, which includes interviewing minorities for these senior level positions. And I think that has been really good for the NFL because there was a long period of time in the NFL where you had like 65 to 70% of the players who were black and had played their whole careers, a lot of experience, blah, 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 and yet none had coaches in the NFL. It's like, really? And so they instituted this rule that just meant like, hey, if that it was kind of the premise behind the rule was the belief that if some owners and general managers sit down with potential coaches who are minorities, that they will then become exposed to ideas that, wait a minute, I was writing this guy off before. This guy is actually pretty brilliant. And like today we have six or seven of the teams in the NFL are coached by black coaches, which is good. Now, it's a little trickier coming into Hollywood. It's a different set of rules and it's a different set of paradigms. But I think it would be great if like the six major studios, collectively just themselves, no one tells them to do it, but if the six major studios got together and said amongst themselves, we have decided what would be great for us, because I think it would be self-beneficial for them to do this, that not that we're implementing a rule of who we must hire, we should always go with who is the best person, absolutely, but we need to make sure we open up the opportunities for other people who have been shut out of our system, whether it's minorities or women or things like that. We need to open up opportunities, not hand out positions, but open up opportunities. I think it would benefit them much like it has benefited the NFL because now the NFL, whereas they might in years past, they would have closed themselves off to great talent. And now they're realizing there is great talent there. I think if they, implement and self-govern themselves and say, we want to create new rules for ourselves. Where we want to make sure that when we are looking at a movie and we want to look at a set of directors, that we make sure that at least two women are on that list of 12 that get it brought in so we can hear their pitches. That, you know, if they did that, I think it would benefit them. Now, of course, you're going to get scenarios where like, if I'm producing a documentary now on what happened to the Green Lantern, uh, no, the Green Arrow Supermax prison, right? I already got a director in mind for that. I, I want John Schnepp he, because I, I that's kind of fits what I, you're always going to get situations like that. But I think if they're self-implemented rules, I think it could work. I think it would be good for Hollywood. I think it would be good for all the talent that could get involved. And I think ultimately it would be good for the audience. So that's just my take on it. Schnepp, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I think it's like a, a both of those things can all be implemented. I think like in commercials and television, when people go to auditions, they might, they, you know, they might have a set of characters and you're like, well, this one's female, this one's male, this one's, um, but you can always, your mind can be changed by someone's audition and whether they're black or white or Hispanic or whatever, you, the, it's the audition and the tryout and they're like, oh, I didn't even think about it like that. They get put on a list and like, maybe if they are not even on, in this commercial or this film, they're now the casting director is like that person, I want to see them in something. Same thing could be said for scripts, which don't have any kind of race or religion attached to them. But I think, but you have to kind of force this can open in a little bit more of a, a, a proactive way. And I think uh, because you see how many women go see films now and you see how many Hispanic people go see films and how many African-American people huge, see huge amounts huge of people. Demographics demographic is giant. So I think 
the studio systems should uh, should implement something a little more proactive by saying, hey, we've got 13 slots that are available. And instead of saying we can we'll just interview different people for all 13 slots. But, oh, look, all white males have gotten all 13 slots. But we did interview other people. They should say we have got 13 slots open. Five of them are available only for women. So we will only audition. You know, we're only going to look at female directors. You know, or like I'm just saying, like if you want to break it up, you, you have to you have to make that opportunity available. You can't. It's, it, that's what I'm saying. It can't be like, well, the best person will win because, like you said, you're gonna you've already people have things in their mind already set, and they're like, you have to take risks, is what I'm trying to say. So, um, one of my favorite things when I because I worked at when I, I worked for Joel Silver's company in development for like th- over three years, and one of my favorite things that we used to do is like well, we when we had projects that directors would come in and we'd sit down and we'd hear their takes and stuff too and and sometimes like like you guys are saying like a director would, that they would just kind of bring it in because they liked his work but didn't think he was right for the role and then we hear his pitch and the way that he, and just how they were in the room and how they were with people and you're like oh wait we weren't consider that guy so that's why i actually think that this this idea of uh, not necessarily the calling of the rooney rule but something mm-hmm. like that right. would work and could work because i think that there are certain directors out there that don't get a shot because what the big studios anyway, they have this list, this comfortable, safe list that they have of the directors that they know can work. And yeah. once they run out of those five or six people, then they start kind of scrambling. Well, who else is out there? Get find me else. And they go to the assistant. What movie did you like that you saw? Can we get that guy? If they had something like this to where like these are the top women out there directing and, and African-American and Hispanic and all these guys, and men and women are out there that are directing and at least have them in for the interview because their take and their pitch on the movie might be something that they weren't looking at. So it would just, like you guys are saying, it's just a matter of opening up the new conversation to do it. I think it's a little tougher to do what you're suggesting, though, Snap, where they have like, these only these five movies can only be directed by women because I think you run into a problem there, too, of saying, well, maybe there's like, there's like a Hispanic or an African-American guy that was like, could have been great for it, but you're kind of closing that out now because you're only letting women do it. I think that everybody should be up for it, but you shouldn't just be closed off to, you should be up, up to new takes and seeing people that you might not know in smaller films that you know the independent films not just the big studio films i i'm I'm in agreement with you but i'm saying like in order to enforce that and make it happen it has to i'm saying you have to have these slots are for african-americans these slots are for women you just have to impose it it, to enforce that rule i I don't know it seems to have worked in the nfl when they say like we they they never implemented a quota they just said you have to interview when you have a position open you have to make sure you at least interview for that and we've seen that work we've seen it's taken time but over time we've seen that work and we see more like african-american executives in the nfl we see more african-american coaches in the nfl because of it and i i think could be dead wrong but i think it could work in hollywood we'd have to wait and see i'm just saying it's like a combination of the two because yes you have a star wars movie and you're like hey they're they're writing the script they're getting these things ready and they're going to pick directors they want but in the same sense you also have to have opportunities that are available and open like keeping an open-ended thing not just hey we've developed these 10 movies we already know what they're going to be about and then we're going to have to find the person who fits that role to direct it you also want to have that other way the two-way street is what i'm trying to say so all right folks so i said we take a little bit of time to take some of your live twitter questions and we're going to do that right now once again you can tweet into us for the next few minutes at collider video ashley what have you picked out rvk movies right what single scene in a movie made you laugh the hardest oh well my my default there's a few that i have on my list i actually have a personalist top 10 funniest single moments you've heard me say this one before though it's not nearly as funny when i say it Mel Brooks, Spaceballs, Dark Helmet, Lone Star. Now, Lone Star, you will see that evil will always triumph because good, wait for it, is dumb. I have never laughed harder or longer or as consistently over the years at any one single moment in a movie in my life than that one. So that's the one for me. Uh, Bruce Almighty, not a great movie, but the Steve Carell yeah. scene. Well, the first time I really got introduced to Steve Carell and, and, and Bruce is doing the powers on him and he's like, <laughs> I lost it in the theater. I just remember just crying laughing. That and Team America, the puppet sex, that killed me. Those two, oh those two things, it, it killed me because like, I wasn't expecting it. So those movies, and I think the last one was when I was really... Um, when I was younger and I watched uh, not Son-in-Law Encino Man Mm. and there's a scene when they're going to the amusement park and they shake like the mascot's head and they hit him in one direction the other way and that just got me I don't know why you're going to uh, with uh, talking about uh, Will uh, Will Carell Steve Carell 
uh, from that. The moment in, in the scene in Forty Year Old Virgin when he's getting the wax. chest hair wax that I I cringe and cry and laugh every time I see that. He's one got a too. great yell. Oh yeah, he he's does. Got a great, got a yell. great yell. I'd say for, I'd say the entire film, Young Frankenstein, it laughed through the entire <laughs> film. But if I was going to pick one scene that I remember seeing in the theater, it was in the late night or mid nineties, Dumb and Dumber. When uh, oh Jim God. Carrey, they're, they're, they, he had just eaten all this hot, and he's like squeezing <laughs> ketchup into his face. Yeah. Just the insane <laughs> dumbness of that film was so contagious. I didn't know what, I just blindly went to go see the movie. I don't even think I'd seen a trailer for it. And I remember almost crying laughing because it was just that dumb. Ashley, what about you? What, what would it be like a common uh, moment? It's hard to, to you? say movie of all or scene of all time but a movie that i can watch over and over again it always cracks me up the scene in bridesmaids when they're on the plane and she's like hello i'm mrs inglesias i love that scene i love the scene of gray meat gray meat and bridesmaids oh. gray meat yeah oh, and then, and oh then my they, gosh, they yes. go to the bridal shop and they're all sick oh and my god that's in the middle of the street mm -hmm. in the, the dress yeah, i love it <laughs> All right, All right next. Um, Brian Reynolds writes, what's the right way to deal with rude peeps in a theater? Scream uh, at them. Yeah, I mean, I honestly don't, it, it, de it depends, and I'm the wrong guy to ask. I mean, really, if somebody's really being really bad, the right thing to do is, and the responsible thing to do is just, you know, walk out of the theater, grab an usher, and say, look, we there's an issue in, in theater five here that somebody's being really disruptive for the whole audience. That's the right thing to do. Um, I have, I told the story about a month ago, I have turned around and just screamed my bloody freaking head off at a group of gaggling teenage girls mm -hmm. who would not shut up. Like it was just unbearable. Uh, and that was the wrong thing to do. I should have gone and gotten an usher and, and handled it. So that's probably the right way to do it. Well, like last night we saw a screening and, and there was a guy, it was like, he, I, I swear, I think he, in front of us? he was like Rocky. He was like Paulie from Rocky. And he, and he's just the whole time. <laughs> yeah, you know what? <laughs> I was yeah. like, Dude. First of all, lower the volume. And it was a press screening too. It mm -hmm. was loud, but that, but no one actually said anything to that guy. I don't know. Maybe yeah. uh, you but, know why? Why? <laughs> well, no, I can't say because there's an embargo till tomorrow. Uh, okay, but. Uh, but nobody said anything uh, to him. But normally, like for me, the thing that always gets me is two things: is that if someone has their feet up, like mm. near me, like right, right here, I, I say, can you please put your your feet down? And then the, the cell phone. There is no reason. For you to be on your cell phone in the theater at all. Mm -hmm. If the big lights, if the screen is, I always say, I, I just can't help it. It's something to me. I go, please turn. I always say, please, please shut your phone down. Shut it down because there's no reason. I can't stand, yeah. but there's no reason for you to be texting or checking videos or anything in the theater. Go in the lobby. It's silly. Yeah. I, I have various different ways to to shut these people down. Snapping necks, breaking legs. Well, if legs. they're in front of you and they're using your cell phone and it's the trailers are over and we're into the movie and the movie has started and they're on their phone, I just yell out loud, boy, I'd love to watch this movie, but all I can see is that person's cell phone in front of me. And I just yell at them. <laughs> the phone goes off and the embarrassment. Or if there's people talking, I will, at the first time, like the movie started, I'll say, hey, What's up? Can you and I'll say it in a full loud voice because everyone in the entire theater is also irritated with these people talking. And if no one's going to say anything, I'm going to say something. I was like, "Would you please not talk?" And then if they start up again, I get out of my seat. I walk right up to them. I don't care if it's a group of people or if it's just one person. I'm saying, "I'm sorry. I don't know if you understand that you're not supposed to talk during the film, and you're ruining my experience." You're not in your living yeah. room. Yeah, that, I say exactly that. Yeah. I say you're not in your living room. I'd like you to stop talking right now. Yeah, and I have no problem. Like in in a theater, if some Somebody is make, makes a real concerted effort, like they want to mention something or ask a right. question, and they really try to be quiet about totally. it. They lean over. That's no. That doesn't yeah. bother me. But it's the it's, giggling and yeah. talking and it's laughing. A, it's that's having what I'm no. About. It's having no yeah. regard that there are other people besides yes. you and the people you're with. And I love. I love reactions to film. Like totally. I always tell this story. My favorite story was the one when I when I saw Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Um, I saw it for a second time, and it's that scene where when Caesar says no, and some guy just had an honest reaction. He goes. Damn! Right. As loud as he could. Actually, yeah. you know what? Is Ray in the room? Ray, hey, Ray, come on camera for a second. He yes, did not that's what Ray, 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 this is this is our uh, Ray, production guy, show. Ray, who does? I don't think Ray's ever appeared on the show. Who does wow. all Someone asked for a Ray. But I got to tell you, you're talking about reactions. I got to, yeah, come on, come on over here, Ray. I got to my my favorite reaction. Ray means Ray means. <laughs> I'm not kidding either. When Ray, when we're watching a movie with Ray, I am not kidding. This, you think this is right out of a movie and right out of a stereotype? Like the girl's about to go down into the basement. Oh no. No, no, she's gonna go down there. Don't go down there. Like he's he's one of these guys. And when it, especially if you're watching a comedy, 
There's no guy who's more fun to watch a comedy with yeah. than him or an exciting movie. He was great. Right. He was great to watch Creed with too, man. Yeah. He was like oh, yeah. Creed. Yeah. Creed. Yeah. 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 He gets very fun. emotional. Yeah. It's like, oh, she's not gonna do that. She's she did that. Right. <laughs> it's like that wasn't really right. Like when it's somebody who's like really into the movie and yeah. it's like and it's fan participation. Yeah, there's nothing that's wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, nothing wrong with that. Unless it's like, you know, Schindler's list. Yeah, then you're like, <laughs> why are you laughing? Why are you cheering? <laughs> Stop it. Okay, what's next? Robbie Diaz writes, why is it harder to please fans with B versus S than any other superhero movies? <laughs> because the movie hasn't come out yet. It's also Batman versus Superman. There's a lot of expectations oh, for yeah, the two most iconic superheroes of all time. Yeah, I, I don't look. No one's seen the movie yet, yeah. so I mean, nobody should be pleased at this point, and nobody should be displeased at this point. All we can be pleased with or displeased with is is the marketing. And honestly, you know, a lot of people who are really looking forward to Batman Superman who's saying, "Oh, everybody's crapping on Batman Superman." No, they're not. They're not. You just got a victim mentality. I find that a lot of DC fanboys and Marvel fanboys too, for that matter, but have victim mentalities. That the moment, look, look, the second trailer was not a great trailer. All right? Saying that the second trailer is not a great trailer does not mean we are shitting on the movie. It just means we're calling it what we saw. Right. Second, doesn't change the fact that the first trailer is one of the greatest trailers I've ever seen. Doesn't change the fact that the, the new 30 second spot they put out with the NFL this week was awesome. But you just call it like it, see it. And so, no, like every everybody out there who thinks, oh, the, the DC fanboys are thinking, everybody's out to get us. No, they're not. No, they're not. The vast majority of people are really looking forward to Batman versus, versus Superman. So I just think we need to take a breath. You know what I also think is it's, it's because there's so much passion and love for those characters from the DC fans and from fans in general. But I think, look, here's the thing, and I've said this, and I talked about it even yesterday. I... I I am not as excited for Batman versus Superman v Superman as I was before. Like I certainly want to see it, but it's just not one of those movies. Like my expectations have been lowered, um, but I don't think it's going to be a bad movie. I still think that it could be good. I just don't care about it as much as like you guys do. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I hate it. Doesn't mean I think it's a terrible, stupid movie. I don't know if it's going to be a terrible movie or a great movie. I certainly hope that it's great. I want Batman v Superman to be a great movie. I love Superman. It's just something for me right now. I'm just not as excited as I've been for other properties. Like I'm more excited for me right now for like. Um, Deadpool and X-Men those movies I'm looking forward to a little mm -hmm. bit more than Batman v Superman but it doesn't mean I hate the movie nah. yeah I I did nothing else to add alright last okay. question of the day oh Harry J.A. Killick writes apart from Les Miserables Miserab, why aren't we seeing big budget musicals based on stage shows Wicked would be a great movie well I think one of the big issues was remember a few years ago they came out with Rent which is a very popular stage uh, stage show, didn't do great at the box office, um, and that kind of put a damper on things. Like you had films like Chicago, which are great. One of one of my top ten all time favorites, uh, Moulin Rouge, I think is spectacular. If you haven't seen Moulin Rouge, by the way, watch it. Mm -hmm. It is fun. It's emotional. It's it's just great. It's it's just a wonderful, wonderful film. Probably my favorite film that you and McGregor's been involved with. Um, but uh, but they're they're tricky to do. They're very tricky to do because you're probably paying a lot just for the rights to do it. And then you know, are, is the movie going on? The movie going on audience is a different audience than the stage show going audience. So it's a roll of the dice. I love Les Mis though. I thought the job they did with Les Mis was magnificent. I love that film. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see a few more. But there's not a lot of stage shows. Unlike Les Mis is one of the rare shows in Chicago that are stage shows but that the whole culture knows about. Right. There's not a lot of those. Like if you go down to Broadway right now, probably most people, unless they're doing a revision of Cats, probably most people don't know or haven't recognized the title of any of those things down there. So right. it's you gotta balance it out. How would you handle that? Shana? I would say, I mean, Book of Mormon is easily something that yeah, I, I went and one. saw yeah. that play. It's musical, it's hilarious. That would trans translate perfectly as a, a uh, you know, theatrical m movie musical. Uh, you have Wicked. I know that's been in production for a long time. Plus, it's something that people know about. It's Wizard yep. of Oz, but with a flip on it. Um, cats still hasn't been done as some gigantic weird. Like, look at all the cats. People, I watch cats every day on YouTube. I'll go see a musical <laughs> with cats in it. Come on. What's wrong with you? They're from outer space. They are doing a Wicked movie, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah with the saying. producer yeah. from Into the Woods. And yeah. um, I'm sad, though, Adina Menzel, who's like one of the biggest on Broadway. She was in Rent, voiced, um, was one of the voices in Frozen. She sang Let It Go. Mm -hmm. She was 
in Wicked on Broadway. She's not going to be in the movie, though. I'm super sad. Oh, that's She's an amazing voice. I thought you said Adele Dazeem. Adele yeah. Dazeem, that's what year. I meant. Yeah. I, heard, I heard John Travolta was going to be in yeah. the movie. Yeah. Right. He's, He's actually going to be, a giant going to be cast, in Wicked. Like yeah. a giant cat with just wings. <laughs> um, I uh, Yeah, I agree with you guys. I think that it's just, just there's not a lot of recognizable properties. All the ones that you guys said are in production right. or should be at least I think they're talking about Book of Mormon or, so. or maybe not I mean because I, I don't it's also they haven't made like even Les Mis didn't make a ton of money right. so it's a big investment yeah Um. so yeah we'll see alright folks that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk thank you so much for joining us listen don't forget lots of great films playing at our friends over at AMC Theaters right now head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and of course your movie ticket information make sure you take a second and subscribe to this YouTube channel keeping you up to date on everything we got going over here at Collider Video and make sure you bookmark Collider.com Steve Frosty Right Rob and his crack team of writers over there doing a great job of keeping you up to date on everything going on in the world of film and television once again bookmark Collider.com that'll do it for us for this show I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me first of all sitting my left Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you and your stupid cats? You guys can find me and my stupid cats working on an adult version of Peanuts, <laughs> as well as you can, you can follow me. Starring just, Ashley Moe. Right. You can follow me at John, just at, on Twitter and uh, Instagram at John Schnepp. You can get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to tdoslwh.com. And don't forget to tune into Collider Heroes coming up later today. And, of course, sitting over here on my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Uh, both Twitter and Instagram, at Christian Harloff. And then we have Collider Jedi Council this Thursday, every Thursday. But make sure that you hashtag Collider Jedi Council. Going to be a lot of Twitter questions this week, so make sure you submit them, and we'll go through them and hopefully get yours on the show. And, of course, our lovely host today... Uh, Still hasn't seen the Peanuts movie. Which I haven't. Very I haven't. Ashley Movie, ladies and gentlemen. Wah, wah, Ashley. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> do it right. You, you, don't even, you don't even know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. That's what your boyfriend says the way you talk. <laughs> or that's <laughs> what your boyfriend says what he hears. That was the least I minute I've ever seen that. day it is. I don't understand what Ashley said. And you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter at John. On camping, don't forget, keep your eye open. My first novel, The Pride, is coming out here pretty quick. I will let you know as soon as it, it is available. So, special thanks to Ray and Wendy and Dennis and Jonathan and all of you for joining us today. Don't forget to jump in the comment section below. Leave your thoughts on any or all of the topics we discuss here today. So, that'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for Collider Video. And until next time, bye bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.